the endeavor of science can and should be seen as a noble effort to bring humanity out of superstition, but it has its limitations. Most importantly, it must stand on some metaphysical principles. Alas, instead, it has spawned its own high-end mysticism and myth. The word science means knowledge, but knowledge can come in two types, true and false. The premise being posited here is that any scientific thinking that violates axiomatic metaphysical principles cannot be valid. The worst thing we can do is to know and rely upon something that is not true. This would be like stepping on a lily pad, thinking it would hold your weight. I'm going to quote J.P. Claiborne, author of Why an Ether is Positively Necessary. The belief persists in some quarters that the concept of an ether as a medium for electromagnetic waves has been completely discredited. Although it is true that the mathematics of electrodynamics and Einstein's special relativity operate without reference to details of a transmission medium, in neither case is the ether concept contradicted. It is simply not addressed. Also, a quote from another physicist, James Owen Weatherall. If physicists can't agree on the properties of empty space, they won't be able to explain the physics of planets or particles either. Now, the EU thinking has been primarily focused on the things that we can apprehend with our senses from the microscopic level to the telescopic level, but mostly on the normal visible level. On just these three levels, there is an overwhelming abundance of phenomena and structure that show the universe works electrically, from galaxies down to cells, down to atoms. Much, if not most, of this should be obvious and would be if a wrong paradigm didn't obscure the thinking. For instance, welders and machinists familiar with electro discharge machining get the electrical cratering and scarring aspects immediately, usually exclaiming that it's obvious. Electrical engineers often find other aspects to be easily assimilated and accepted. But many plasma phenomena on this triune level are not that familiar to scientists. For example, Birkeland currents, double layers, cells, and Peratt instability formations have not been widely understood and plasma phenomena can be very complex as well as being outside of our normal experience. Let me remind us about our limitations. It should be understood that below the level of the various microscope tools or beyond the various telescope tools, when thinking about the material universe, Aspects and attributes of phenomena and structure cannot be apprehended directly by our senses, our sight, nor by the other senses. We can only do experiments and get clues as to what we are dealing with, and then we can only build models for and or project metaphors or analogies from our tangible experience on these aspects. I suggest that our ignorance is profound. We don't know what we think we know. This restricted domain on the lower level includes the basic atomic particles, and we can only get blurry visual patterns of nuclei shape and where they are located and arranged in material. 
to this point, theory has claimed that atomic nuclei must be symmetrical in three dimensions, either spherical, flattened, or elongated spherical, as in a discus or a rugby ball shape. Now we can confirm that some nuclei are pear-shaped and oriented in a specific spatial direction. This development actually sweeps away much current cosmological theory. Even the orbital model of the atom has not been confirmed, and part of the time it must be discarded in atomic model thinking. On the other end of the spectrum, we should be mindful that we have only electromagnetic radiation giving off by radiating bodies or structures that we can access through our telescopes. Sound, tactile sensation, smell, and taste are not available for analysis or consideration. Nothing else comes through, just light. No direct chemical analysis to determine material or molecular structure. No physical analysis to determine density, specific gravity, index of refraction, hardness, viscosity, etc. No application of tape measures, scales, hydrometers, or reagents. Just and only patterned radiation to work with. Thus, on the lower levels, Concepts that we have can be little more than pure speculation. We have a tendency to project the orbital metaphor on atomic structure, but this is probably unwarranted. Mainstream thinking has imagined quarks on the lowest level, and the EU, the Electric Universe model, talks about sub-subatomic particles as positive or negative subtrons. The point is that beyond sensationalism, there is little justification to present these physics flights of fancy to the public as knowledge. Let's be mindful that all our relevant observations have taken place from a platform within familiar distances within our own sun's heliopause, and essentially within a platform perpendicular to the axis of the sun. When considering bodies outside of our platform in more distant outer space, we are usually projecting from our own environment and then speculating. We don't know enough about the true distances, the true sizes, and the attributes of the regions, such as any charge differential, ether density, field strength, etc. We can't confidently extend meaningful values on the decrease of force with distance of the three distance squared formulas. Thornhill is even suggesting that the attractive force that we call gravity actually turns into repulsion at some point. The Electric Universe model lays a theoretical foundation for all of this on the atomic particle level by positing just and only two electric charge carriers, negative and positive matter particles, and just and only two forces, electric attraction and repulsion. These foundational things along with sequence, motion, and the aspects and constrictions of the geometry of three dimensions account for or undergird all other physical phenomena, including polarity. Also, in my understanding of the EU model, the definition of energy is that it is always matter in motion in relation to the rest of the universe, not something mystical nor even a thing in and of itself. Early theoretical physics accepted the existence of an ether, and it is only a modern scientific failure to detect it that has precluded it. The famed Michelson-Morley-type experiments and others have so far not given positive results that are expected if an ether is present. However, 
The problem is probably in carrying aspects of the wave and water analogy or metaphor along for light waves that are not applicable. On the other hand, the earth may carry along an entrained cocoon of ether with it. Because of some assumptions that may not be true, science will tell you it has disproved this, but it hasn't. The measured decrease in the speed of light over the last century or two does indicate an ether that is getting denser in the vicinity of the Earth. Given that there cannot be voids of nothingness in the universe, the electric universe model, because of both sound evidence and reasoning, has confidently settled on the conclusion that the volume of the physical universe is filled with an ether. In other words, the existence of an ether is next to being axiomatic. Currently, the thinking is that this ether is composed of polarizable neutrinos, where these are matter particles that have a vanishingly small amount of mass energy and dipolarity in their empty state. These dipolar particles can spin axially, rotate radially, and oscillate. The internal mass energy would be some combination of these three internal motions. There would be no skin, of course. If you build a universe of three dimensions that can't have any voids, then you have only two regular polyhedrons that can fill or tessellate a volume those being tetrahedrons and cubes. So if we must think of shape, it may be we should think of ether particles having one of these two forms. On the other hand, neutrino-based particles probably are asymmetrical in shape. At this point, we have crossed the border into a different realm and are deep into projecting a topological shape metaphor onto it. But since other more substantial particles and objects apparently move without friction through this ether medium, the particles must be quite flexible, if not compressible, and their surfaces must be without friction. Their vanishingly small mass would generate vanishingly small viscosity. In conclusion, Science is far from perfect and has a serious problem in being intellectually responsible on these foundational levels. <laughs>